You may be seated. Glory to God. Every time I stand up here, it's just, I just count it as a privilege and an honor because I know Bishop doesn't just uh, let anybody just come up here, but I'm just so thankful. But first of all, I want to uh, say the best is yet to come. I'm taking it for myself, and you receive it, too. I want to give God glory this morning, all honor and all praise. It belongs to him. Let me tell you, we are what we are because of Christ, and I'm so thankful for that. And I always have to thank uh, my bishop, Glenn Kyer, and First Lady Linda Kyer. Words, I don't have enough words to express our gratitude and our thankfulness to you. We appreciate you. We love you. We're always praying for you. We got you undergirded as you're traveling. And we know that once your feet hit the ground, that atmospheres and climates are going to be changed for the glory of God because of what you all both are carrying. So we know all is well. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Just want to give honor to my husband, all of you all. Saints, our visitors, thank you for coming, and we pray that you won't leave the way you came. Amen? Glory to God. Whew, I don't know why sometimes I get up here, I feel kind of jittery on the inside, but what I'm going to do is just go ahead and pray before I get started. This uh, ministry, the foundation, and the DNA of this ministry is prayer. And so what I want to do is just pray. You can pray along with me before I get started. Father, it's in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just bless you this morning, God. We give you glory. We give you honor, Lord. We lift you up because you are an incredible God. Nobody like you, oh God. We thank you. We adore you, God. We esteem you high because you are mighty in power, mighty in strength, oh God. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we call for the preaching, anointing, ministering power to fall in this place in the name of Jesus. Lord, begin to touch hearts, begin to touch minds, oh God. Lord, those that need spiritual healing, natural healing, whatever it is, we decree and we declare by the authority of Jesus Christ that healing is coming now. In the name of Jesus, oh God. Heal minds, heal bodies, heal bones, heal joints, heal thyroid disorder, cancer, fibromyalgia. God, you have got the power to do it right now. And we stand in your presence, God, believe in you. We believe for deliverances to take place this morning in the name of Jesus. And Lord, most of all, we pray for souls. Lord, that's what you died for. You died for souls. <laughs> so, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that if someone is here and they're not saved, God, that at the end of this message, Lord, that they will come and dedicate or rededicate their life to you for your glory, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we call every backslider back home today in the name of Jesus. We call every prodigal son and every prodigal daughter back to you today in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God. Oh God, we bind up the spirit of fear this morning. We bind up the spirit of intimidation this morning in the name of Jesus, Lord. And we lose liberty in the name of Jesus, oh God. Holy Ghost, have your way. Move up and down each and every aisle. Touch each and every person. Don't let nobody leave the way they came today, God. Even the young people upstairs, God. Minister to them, oh God. In the name of Jesus, oh God. From the youngest to the oldest, God. We thank you today. We thank you. We thank you, oh God. We give you praise. We give you glory and we give you honor because you are God and there's nobody like you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your joy. Joy, joy, joy. Lord, we thank you for joy this morning in the name of Jesus. We bind up oppression, depression. We bind up concerns this morning about bodies in the name of Jesus about family about challenges Lord and we release the divine power of the Holy Ghost 
to set your people free. Free in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I've given this message the title, Tools, Tools for the Assignment. And a subtopic, humility and submission. Hallelujah. Tools for the assignment. These, I'm going to give you just a few. There are more. But there's two specific ones that I'm going to talk about this morning. Tools for the assignment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Incredible God. He's an incredible God. My God. Hallelujah. Nobody like him. Tools for the assignment. Hallelujah. I want to take my time. I'm not like nobody. I don't want, you know what? I don't want to be like nobody else. I want to be who God uh, called me to be. I can't preach like nobody else. Some people say, well, I want to be like so-and-so, uh-uh. Or I want to be like him. I want, no, uh-uh, I don't, I don't. I appreciate the guidance in my life, but I don't want to be like nobody but Jesus. That's who I want to be like. Glory to God. Because when you say you want to be like somebody else and you start calling out their name, then you want everything that they had to go through to get to where they are. I, I, let me tell you, I don't want what nobody else went through. It's enough for me to go through the things that God has allowed me to go through and still come out victorious and still going through and coming out victorious. Because let me tell you something, until the day we die and go be with the Lord, it won't be over. That is, if you want to grow in Christ, there will always be something to help us grow. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, glory to God. When we, as a people, a church, a called out body of believers, have a God-given assignment, a mandate, in other words, which is an official order from heaven, it goes way past a time or scheduled event. It becomes our very reason for existence in the earth. Using as an example, the relationship summit. Remember that? Then there was igniting the fire through prayer conference. It was not only an event, but it was a divine call. It was a mandate that is mandatory in which the Holy Spirit has put in each of us to go higher and deeper in the things of God. There were times of impartation, times of becoming more ignited with God's holy word, and the spirit of prayer for God's great glory in the earth and in us as a group of loyal and set-apart people. After all, that's the reason and the basic foundation for why we do what we do. For Christ to be glorified in us as individuals and as a holy nation. And also knowing that the greatest relationship that we can have is the relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. The greatest, the greatest relationship that any of us can have is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Developing that relationship with Jesus Christ. An intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. We can love our family and we love spending time with family, but that is not the greatest relationship. The greatest relationship that we can have, I'm saying it again, is developing 
your relationship with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It is my heart's desire, and I pray that it is yours as well, to be found in the center of God's will as we grow daily. Allowing the mind, allowing the Lord's mind to continuously migrate to our mind. It's always God's mind migrating to our mind. Lord, let your mind be in me. This blessed assurance can only come first by seeking him daily in the secret place. The secret place. The secret place. It helps us to become more acquainted with his character and his way. The secret place. He who dwells. And like it says in Psalms 91, he who dwells in the secret place. Not just sometimes I pray and sometimes I go in, but he who dwells consistently, persistently on a daily basis. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. When you dwell in the presence of the Lord and you pray daily, you have power over all forces of darkness. No power on this earth can withstand the power and the fire of God. He who dwells, he, do, who, he, he who doesn't just come every now and then. He who doesn't just stumble in every now and then. Well, I need something. I'm going to church today. Oh, I need something. I'm going to get on a prayer line tonight. Oh, I, I need something. I'm going to go to Friday night prayer. No, it says he who dwells. If you want to conquer, you got to dwell in his presence. And I'm not saying that to say that you won't deal with anything in, anything in life because we will. But the more you dwell in his presence, the more you'll know the authority that you have in Jesus Christ. That you got power over all power and enemy. And nothing is really going to hurt you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We must be careful that we don't unintentionally abandon our first love for fleshly cravings and unfruitful ambitions. God is empowering us for our kingdom assignment. And it's two qualities that I believe we must keep at the forefront of our fulfilling our God-given God -given assignment. Submission and humility. And I want to give you some example, examples in scripture pertaining to those. Turn with me to Acts, the ninth chapter. And I'm going to read a little bit, but you all follow with me. Let me tell you, the more words you get in, the more, the more words you get in you, the more power you will attain. It's the word that has power. It's God's breathed word, not just to read it, begin to speak it. Begin to speak it into atmospheres, wherever God has got you, in your home, on your job. Speak the word. Speak the word. I mean, the, the Bible has so many examples. It's not a history book. It's a book of revelation. And we should read it every day. Acts the ninth chapter. And I'm going to start reading. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. I'm going to start with verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their co cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on, on this mission, a, high, I mean, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground. And heard a voice saying to him, 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul st stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over the straight street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarshish named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales from Saul's eyes, some, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterwards, he ate some food and regained his strength. I've read that scripture so, so many times, but this time when I read it, I saw something different. This was even the scripture that came to me when I first got saved about over 30 some years ago, and I didn't even understand it because I believe the Holy Spirit, I mean, just little verses that he was giving me from that scripture, I wrote down because I didn't understand. I mean, it was like he was saying, I wrote down, I'm just paraphrasing it, kicking against the prick. Uh, why are you persecuting me? And I was thinking, okay, that's Saul. But God was speaking to me. He was saying, you know, why are you persecuting me? And I was thinking, I'm not persecuting you. I'm, I'm not doing anything. What, what, what do you mean? I'm, uh, and why I'm kicking against the prick? But I was. And I'm just going to talk about myself. I was persecuting God because I wasn't living a life that was pleasing to him. So the things I was doing and the things that I was saying, it was kind of like persecution to, persecution to Jesus Christ. One of the things that we can see in these scriptures and in life itself is that when we're confronted with the very presence of God, there is no room for arrogance. There, there is something, as you and I know, when we consider God, when we encounter God in a real and genuine way, whether through weeping, whether it's silence, whether you're being still, or even being slain, when, we, when we're overcome by the weighty presence, it humbles us very quickly. Woe is me. One becomes undone. A few of the words to a familiar song says, when the spirit of the Lord comes up on me, I will dance like David danced. An encounter, a genuine encounter with God, brings about a spirit of humility to overshadow us. Notice in the scriptures it says, from the moment Saul encountered God's presence, he ended up on the ground. And that's what I saw when I read that. As soon as Saul encountered the presence of God, he ended up on the ground. He went low. 
humility. He was changed, and he was changed quickly. When we have a Damascus Road experience, we are changed. Scales fall from our eyes. What we used to say, we don't want to say anymore. What we used to do, we don't want to do anymore. The places we used to go, we don't want to go anymore because it doesn't interest us. We've had a born-again experience. Not a spirit experience where you go back into your mother's womb. This is spirit. When God really changes you and when you have a real encounter with God, you will never be the same. And I'm not saying, I'm not talking about, you know, slip-ups and perfection because we're not perfect, but we serve a perfect God. But if we do, we want to get back up and get it right. And we want to get it right quickly. We don't want it to linger. It's always about the glory of God. John 3, 3 in the King James Version says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot, unless he's born again, he, uh, renewed, always gone, always changed, because you had a Damascus Road experience. And that's sometimes what I pray when I pray for people. Lord, give them a Damascus Road experience that's tailored specifically for them. Glory to God. As believers, we can have a continual visitation and continual fillings of the Holy Spirit for the assignment and the journey that has been set before us. We need continual fellowship with the Holy Spirit and constant communication also. Without that, we can do nothing of value for the kingdom of God. We go from glory to glory, to glory, to glory with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Without that, we become putty in the hands of the enemy. Glory, to glory, to glory, to glory. We can't let, allow the enemy to get a foothold. We can't allow the enemy to sneak in through any cracks in our lives, in our homes. That's why I always talk and say it's so, so important for men to pray in your home, to cover your children, cover your wife, cover them. Don't let a foothold get in. Because once you let that full foothold get in, it begins to grow. It begins to build. First it's this little thing, then it's that, then it goes on to the next one. You can't do that. And then if you're a single woman, God is covering you, but you still got to pray. You still can't allow for little things, little foxes, to seek into your life, to seek into your, uh, even your body, your mind. Because sometimes the, the mind is always the battleground. And all the enemy needs, I just, let me just get in. And I know they're a Christian, but you know they need this. And let them just do this. Nobody will know. Nobody will see them. But God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He knows everything. And when I know that myself, that kind of puts a little fear and reverence in me. I said, well, they, you know, the people at the church didn't hear that. People in church didn't see that. But I'm going to go to church Sunday. Well, well, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know the, uh, <laughs> y'all know I always have to go here. They didn't hear that. A uh, serious conversation my wife, my husband and I had. They didn't hear that. But see, I can go to church and still, and I can still jump and shout, but I didn't get that right. God is God. We can't let a foothold get in. We, we can't even let a crack get in. We got to make things right because we're building. We're on an assignment. God has us all on an assignment in different areas of our life, in the workplace, in the home. Let me tell you something. Your home is a first assignment. Your home. Now, my grandmother used to say it another way. She said, charity started home and spread abroad. I didn't know what she was talking about. I thought something wrong with her. But I got it now. Your first assignment is in your home. 
Now, let me tell you, you how you going to go out here and preach to the masses and then something in here ain't right? I mean, I can't do it. Now, some of you, my, I can't. I mean, even if I ain't saying nothing to him, I mean, I still can't. I don't want, I don't even want to, sometimes I have to, now, let me tell you, I can be transparent because I ain't scared. We've been married 40 some years, so if I have to use us for an example for you all to scared about that, I'll do it. He don't care. Well, I mean, I ain't saying he don't care. You know, if it's going to bless somebody else, come on, we got to get this thing right. I'm talking about humility, and I'm going to talk about submission. Come on, and this ain't in my notes, but it, it just came back to me. One day I was on Fresh Oil, and I said something about uh, order. The man is the head. Can I find that scripture? The man is the head as Christ. I'm just paraphrasing. As Christ is the head of him. Am I? So if the man is the head and he God, it, you know, not God, but you know what I'm saying. Then that means that a man is responsible for what's going on in his household. And if nothing's not right, then he got to get it right. He got to go to God. Knowing that he's the covering and pray for things to get right in that household and don't let even a foothold come in. No, uh-uh, Mr. Devil, you're not coming in here today. You get out, you stay out, you can't stay in here. This is God's house. So we got to have things in order. The order of God, the man, the man praying, the man interceding. That's good, you know, we pray together. But the man crying out to God. Come in, God. I'm seeking you for my wife, for my children, for my grandchildren. I bind up this. I bind up that, and I loose this in my home first. Because when that get right, everything else is going to produce. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Where would we all be if it had not been for Christ? Jesus Christ. You know, they always say when I look back over my life, that's true. It's the grace and the mercy of God. Where would any of us be if it had not been for Jesus Christ? Glory to God. Some of us didn't even have Christ on our minds. We were enjoying life, though it seemed. Even when, even when we were in our mother's womb, God knew his thoughts and plans for us. Even when we are out there doing all kinds of things, God, God, he pulled us in. He opened our eyes. He brought us to the ground low. He humbled us in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He captured us. He arrested us with the Holy Ghost and fire. He came for us. Each individual person, God came for you. He rescued us. Humility and, and submission are tools to help us grow. And they're not to harm us, but they're there to propel us into his presence. Sometimes the Lord allows situations and circumstances to come into our lives and no matter how many times we try to run away, and we do run away, he is there with outstretched arms and hands. He sometimes prepares a place. He prepares a situation. He prepares a circumstance or a person to get our attention. Turn with me to Jonah, the second chapter. I'm not going to be up here. I'm just going to say what I believe the Lord uh, wants me to say. And I'm going to sit down and pray in the name of Jesus that it touches somebody's heart. Amen. Jonah, the second chapter. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. After Jonah's submission to God's plan for his life. That's what the part I'm going to read. I'm not going to read Jonah of the first chapter. I'm going to go to the second chapter. Hallelujah. Jonah finally surrendered and submitted, although he was made to feel uncomfortable 
while he was running from God and his assignment. At times, doing what God calls us to do is no easy task. Sometimes it may be counterculture, but through humi humility and submission, the Holy Spirit will empower us for the assignment. Glory to God. When God puts himself in us, there's no place we can go or hide that he won't that he's not able to find us. Glory to God. Jonah, the second chapter. This is the prayer that Jonah prayed. This is an example of still submission and humility. Jo then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. You know, sometimes you have to pray inside your challenges. You got to cry out to God even in the midst of it, even when you don't feel like it. Or what, I, I know, God, I, I don't feel like praying. No, God said you got to cry out to me even in the belly of it, even in the midst of the challenge, even when your money don't look right, even when you're lonely, even when your children are disobedient. They're going contrary to the way you've raised them. You still got to cry out to God. Even when there's conflict in your home, you still got to cry out to God, even in the belly of it. You can't let God go. And I pray this is helping someone this morning. You cannot let God go. Even when you don't feel like it, you got to press into his presence. That's not just a song we sing. It's the truth. And I'm a living witness. You don't know how many times I prayed and I had to cry and pray. I had to fast. I had to pray and I had to cry. Then I had to get up and brush myself all and say, off and say, God, it's, it's about you. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about your glory. It's about what you're getting ready to do in my life for your glory. Not me. It's not about me. Not my will. Your will be done in me, through me. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven for your glory. So the next time you're confronted with something, you feel like your mouth is shut and you can't open your mouth and pray, you press. I told you before, it's in your mouth. And that's the, that's the deception of the devil. He wants to get your mouth closed so you won't pray. He don't want you to say nothing because he knows that the victory is in your mouth. He knows that you can decree and declare and things, see things begin to change. According to the word of God. That's his attack. In your mouth. You use your mouth. You use your tongue for any, any other thing. Why not use it for the word of God. Speak life. Speak it over your family. Speak it over your finances. Speak it over your home. Speak it over the church. Speak it over your church leaders. Speak life over them. Aha. Glory to God. Speak life. Don't speak death. Speak life. We got to speak life, life, life in the mighty name of Jesus. I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble and he answered me. Come on. That's it right there. I cried out to the Lord and say I called up somebody on the phone and I talked to them and I told them all everything going on in my life what I don't have what I don't, what ain't my children ain't got I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble and God <laughs> answered me now I know that's right let me just stop right there I have to give you another example I always let me tell you God will take people out of your life I mean Whichever way, if you put too much confidence in a person and you got them on a pedestal and you got them as an idol, God will let you see something or he will take them literally out of your life to let you know I am God. And beside me, there is no other. I have had friends when I got saved. I had so much confidence in the friends. I had confidence in leaders because I thought I wouldn't know I ain't nothing. I'm just old son out here. 
I'm just old sinner, so I got confidence in everybody else but me. Even when I believed God was dealing with me and showing me something, I still had a friend. I'm going to tell you about that one, too. I had a friend I had to go and call up and say, well, look, I told you about a bishop. She don't even talk to me no more. I, every time I had to call, she, she prophesied over my husband before we even got in this ministry. She told us everything about Bishop, how he was going to look, everything. But you know what? Today she don't even speak to me. I haven't done nothing to her. I said, God, why you take her away from me? I would go to her. I would believe God was showing me something, but I had to go check with her. I had to go, well, look. Look, uh, this is what God showed me. What do you think about that? And she would have something to say. I mean, you know, because, you know, she was a prophet. I was just Rachel. And then I remember one day she told me, I asked her something. She said, well, you know what, Rachel, you're not where I am. So you got to watch for that spirit, too. God had to show me and show me things through hurt and pain. So I said, keep on crying out to God from the, from the belly of the whale. Yeah. She don't talk to me no more. I mean, I, I, I sent her a text, what's wrong? Everything all right? And what's going on? And she wouldn't respond. And so I called her sister back in Virginia. What's wrong with her? Why she ain't calling me? You know what her sister told me? Well, I don't want to call her name. She's not calling you because the Lord ain't leading her. I was floored. The Lord ain't leading you to call me. And that may be true because I see it now. God said, uh-uh. Every idol, every person that you've had in your life that you put up on a pedestal above me, I'm wiping them out. <laughs> That's for somebody today. I'm wiping them out. I can't call her. She don't call me. I didn't do nothing to her. I didn't do nothing to her. I was her friend. We've been friends ever since the third grade. And now she don't even call me. And I think about it today because the other day I said, maybe I'll text her. Lord said, nope. Call if you want to. Now, I'm not, that ain't the way God said it, but that's the way I'm telling you. You better not call her. Because if you call her, you're going to get back in a place that I'm delivering you from. So, I said, okay, Lord. It don't feel good. Because she was a prophet of prophets. But you know what? God was doing something. He's still doing something in me. I want you to hear my voice. I don't want you to hear from her. I want you to have a relationship with me. In the name of Jesus. I want you to hear me. I want you to be acquainted with my voice. Because you are too acquainted with her voice. You depending on her too much. Okay. Glory to God. Mm. I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. Come on. That could be depression, oppression for somebody. You feel so low. You down, you down to the lowest you can go. But God said, cry out to me. Glory to God. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Yet I will look once more. To your holy hill. Come on. This is for somebody. Look up. Come on. You look up. Don't keep your head down. It's only temporary. It's not going to last forever. You're going to go from glory to glory. As you humble yourself. And as you submit to the things of God. You're going to be okay. I sank beneath the waves. And the waters closed over me. Seaweed. Wrap this self around my head. Come on. Glory to God. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth. Whose gates locked shut forever. Come on. Glory to God. But you, O oh Lord, my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. Now, I'm not talking about natural death. I'm talking about spiritual death. It's God. It's got to be God, it's got to be God, or it's going to be God, it's got to be all God. Glory to God. He said, you should have no idol before me. It's God. Glory to God. 
as my life was slipping away. Hallelujah. Come on, that's sometimes depression. You feel like you're losing it. You feel like you feel like your mind. I can't take no more. My mind, I told you that's the battleground. That's the place where the enemy tries to pull you down in your mind, making you think something that's not even true. When that happens, you confess the word of God. Say, I am not that. I am not that anymore. I am not going to do that. I am not going to use those things to comfort me. I'm not going to do that. That's not God. That's unholy. That's unrighteous. You got to talk back to the enemy. You can't just sit there and let him back. Whoa. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I did. I, I, I did do that, Mr. Devil. I did it. You right. No, you better rise up out of dark darkness, out of the horrible pit that he is trying to put you in and tell him who he is and what you are in God. Tell him who he ain't. Tell him what he is not going to do. You're going to have to do these things to fulfill the assignment that's on your life. Because if you don't do these things, you will never fulfill the God-given task and assignment that has come from the Lord. Come on. Glory to God. You got a mandate on your life. And it's from heaven. And it's God. So you got to continue to press in. You got to do things that you don't feel like doing. Of God. You got to come on Friday night when you don't feel like coming. Oh, so cool out of my. You got to come on the trail line on Tuesdays when you don't feel like getting on there. Let me tell you. I've said it before. Do you think I feel like? You think I feel like? But I got a call from God. I got a commission from God. I know what I'm commissioned to do, and he's showing me every day. So I got to continue to keep myself humble. I can't boast and brag about Rachel. I got to talk about God. When people even say things about me, oh, Pastor Rachel, Pastor, I said, thank God. I give you the glory. Because God said, if you humble yourself up under my mighty hand, I will do the exalting. Woo, Jesus. I will do the exalting, and I'll do it in the due season. Not when you think it's time. I am the one that's going to bring you before great and powerful men when it's time. Not when you think it's time. Oh, glory. Okay, see, my page is blown. Okay. Glory to God. Okay, the wind is blowing. Y'all just bear with me. I got to find my sheet again. My hands are shaking. But y'all bear with me because my note flew out. And I want to finish reading that chapter. So just hold on. See, you know what? That'll throw some people. It ain't throwing me. I know my assignment. I'm going to say what I got to say, and I'm going to sit down. Turn it back over to the hands of Bishop Lynn Kyle, my pastor, my, my, not my pastor, my bishop. <laughs> okay. Where was I? Okay, I'm going to go back to verse 7. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. And my earnest prayer went out to him, went to my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Prayer is the key. I know we can pray at home, and I want, you know, it's good to pray at home. It's good to pray at home, but it's good to get together with the body of believers and pray so we can have a synergy, so we can see things begin to happen, so we can see mountains begin to move, so every mountain become, can become a level plain. Every valley will be straightened out. So we can speak grace, grace, grace to every mountain. Every mountain of affliction. Every mountain of lack. Every mountain of infirmity. We can speak grace, grace, grace to the mountain. The more you know about God, the better you can pray. If you're, if you're, uh, uh, let's see what word I can use. Well, I'll just say it. If you're limited in, re limit, 
if you, your limit is not in reading the word, a lot, uh, word of God a lot, you're not going to be able to pray. Right. You got to know what the spirit you're wrestling with. Bless, bless her and bless him ain't good enough. You better go down deep and bind up that spirit of infirmity, that lying spirit, that spirit of deception, that spirit of manipulation, that narcissistic spirit. You got to recognize it. And the only way you can get all th those things is by spending time in the presence of the Lord. Neglecting yourself. Glory to God. And my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. Look, it's a, and people worship false gods too. Some people worship money. That's a false god. Some people worship their children. That's a false god. Okay. Now, I know y'all don't want to hear that, but that's okay. Because you can. You can worship some false gods. You worship your clothes. You worship them new shoes you wear. Them stilettos. I don't know what the men call them because I, I ain't trying to be prejudiced in nobody. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifice. Sacrifice. I will offer sacrifices to you. With songs of praise. Sacrifice. It's a sacrifice to come to Friday night prayer. It's a sacrifice to get on the phone on Tuesdays when you can find a thousand things to do that we think we should do that are more important than that. It's a sacrifice, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Look, you can look at... You can look... I mean... Like I said, I'm not looking for no praises um, to myself. But people say, Pastor Rachel, this is a Pastor Rachel that. I'm here. I'm on Tuesday phone line. I'm here on Fridays. I'm here in church, my husband and I both. And we have been for years doing things according to the will of God. And he has blessed us. God has and he's still doing it. And it's even greater. The best is yet to come. You ain't seen nothing yet. And it has nothing to do with age. Sometimes age is maturity and wisdom. Wisdom. And then sometimes people can be older and they don't have wisdom. They want to be like the young folks. They want to hang out with the young people. These places where the young people go, you know, I want to go where my daughter be going. Where you going, baby, tonight? I'm going with you. <laughs> but I w no, but we know what? We got to be an example. You got to be an example in the home. We got to be an example. We got to be an example of our children. Some people don't have no, they're not even going to church. And what are they seeing in us? And then when the least little thing that we do or another church does, then they start making a mockery of the church. That's what I see on social media a lot. People making mockery of the church. And some of it's true, but it's still mockery. You don't be, shouldn't be putting that up on, on social media. If you see something that's not right, go into your secret place and begin to pray. Talk to God about it. Don't be putting it on social media for everybody to see. Oh, well, look what this preacher said. I saw one, oh Lord, I started to, but I said, I ain't going to send it. Because I'm going to tell you, it's just, it's disgusting what you see. Making a mockery because this boy's up at the altar getting prayed for. And he thanks the people in the church for what they did for him. Then he started talking about who's seeing who in the church. I said, that's a mockery. That's a mockery. And people think, people that don't go to church, they love it. They love that stuff because a lot of times, what are they saying about us? That we hypocrites. And what I say, well, if the church is a hypocrite and you are all right, then you come on in the church and fix the church by your life. If the church and everything in the church, it ain't right, look at them. Hey. Well, then you get in there and make it right. You got all the answers, get with the pastor, the bishop, and y'all talk about it and you make it right. I'm getting ready to close in a few minutes. I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Look, then after all that, look at this last verse 10. Then the Lord 
ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. After you have suffered a while, after you have prayed long and hard, after you have endured and waited for your assignment through humility and submission, glory to God, after you have suffered a while, then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out. Running away from God is not the answer. Humility and submission will always win. The Bible tells us to humble ourselves up under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt us in due season. Amen? I'm going to ask you a question. I got three down here, then I'm going to ask Mike to play this song. It's an old song. It's just a, so I've just been listening to some old songs, I'm telling you. Sometimes, you know, when you first get saved and you got songs that you used to listen to, sometimes go back and listen to those songs that you used to listen to when you first got saved. You know, they say in the church, go back to the old landmark. When I, when I first received him. You know, y'all might not know that, but I come from a Baptist church, so. <laughs> go back to the old landmark when you first got saved. Those songs that got you to the place that you are now. Glory to God. Let me ask you these, these questions. Then I'm going to be finished. How many of you can honestly say without a doubt that you still thirst for the Lord's presence and his will to be done in your life? Now, you don't have to raise your hand. I want you to think about it. Do you still do you still, can you honestly say without a shadow of a doubt that you still thirst and hunger for the Lord's presence and his will to be done in your life? How many of you can say, not my will, but your will be done in me for your glory? Not my will, not my thoughts, not my mind, not my desire, but yours. And I seek you daily to find that out. How many of us can say that we are taking active steps? Not just talking, not just thinking. How many of us, regardless of your age, can say that we are taking active steps to seek his mind, his heart, and the assignment for our life? And when you leave here, I want you to be thinking about that. How many of us are actively, or are we just sitting by and waiting for the sweet by and by? Glory to God. Hungry and thirsty, Lord, here we are, yielded to you and your assignment for our lives. Individually and corporately, we can still say yes to you, O oh God. Hallelujah. Let me just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for each and every person that's hearing it. Lord, may they become active in the assignment that you've given them, whatever it is, Lord. May they get up under the leadership of this church, oh God, and begin to uh, seek and, and talk about what it is you've called them to do. And may they get in place in humility. May they submit to the authorities of this body of believers, oh God, in the name of Jesus. If we slacked up in any area, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will cause us by the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit to get it right. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So that's all I have. I don't 